So I'll present the first case. There we go. Um, so this is a 61 year old male with no significant past medical history or past surgical history, um, taking no medications, came into the ED with 24 hours of right lower quadrant pain, congestive fevers, and nausea vomiting, which completely resolved by the time he came to the ED. Um, we did an extensive review of systems um, in taking his history and everything was pretty much negative. No diarrhea, no recent travel or sick contacts, um, no family history of IBD um, or malignancy. He was afebrile, had stable vital signs and abdomen was benign. Um, his CT abdomen pelvis with contrast, which was obtained by the ED, showed terminal ileitis with a small bowel obstruction seen at the TI. Labs were fairly unremarkable. His white count was 11 with a slight neutrophilic predominance. CRP was elevated at 26, but otherwise had a normal ESR, hemoglobin, iron studies, and a negative quant gold. He had three prior colonoscopies. His last one was five years ago, and all of them were reportedly normal and had no prior EGD. So here's a, um, a photo of his CT scan. If you can look towards the right lower quadrant, you can see that there's some um, thickening of the terminal ileum and some sur mild surrounding uh, inflammation. So we did a colonoscopy on this gentleman while inpatient with concern for possible IBD or infectious causes, or maybe even a small bowel malignancy. Um, we were able to intubate fairly deeply into the TI, and these are the representative images that we saw. Um, really, everything looked great. There were no gross abnormalities. We didn't see any erosions, any masses. Um, we did take several um, random TI biopsies, and surprisingly, the path showed a Pyers patch. So this patient was um, discharged uneventfully, and we planned for doing an outpatient capsule to fully evaluate his small bowel. So why did I choose um, this thrilling case um, for, for endoscopy conference? Um, Ryan had actually shared with me a, a really nice paper this week um, about the diagnostic yield of random TI biopsies. So I, so I thought it'd be a good thing to talk about. Um, I'm always interested in why we do things and uh, what are the kind of yields of the different tests that we perform. Did you consider doing a diagnostic laparoscopy? Uh, we did not. His symptoms were completely resolved um, by the time he came to the ED um, and he and he wanted to go home after the colonoscopy. I guess that's something we, we could have considered having surgery do. Um, okay. Um, so here uh, is the paper that I'll talk about, the diagnostic value of endoscopic terminal ileal biopsies. This was uh, published in 2007 by the American Journal of Gastroenterology. Um, here's the background on kind of the conception of the paper. Um, this was written by UM pathologists. They were seeing about 50 lower GI biopsies per day. Many of these were terminal ileal biopsies um, and in general, just didn't really see much of a histologic correlate uh, and wanted to take a look further. Um, the TI biopsy is commonly performed as we all know. Um, the most common indications are to assess for Crohn's disease um, or to evaluate abnormal imaging findings. The differential is extremely broad. Um, I won't go into here, but include infectious, inflammatory, ischemic, and neoplastic causes. Um, so the study design, this was a retrospective review of about 400 patients um, with TI biopsies that were taken over a two-year period from 20 full-time UMGI faculty. Um, they basically looked at the histologic or pathologic findings as compared with the indication for the procedure and the endoscopic findings at time of uh, TI intubation. And here are the results. Um, so the indications most commonly um, found to be uh, indicated for, for doing a TI biopsy were number one, known or strongly su su suspected Crohn's disease, um, number two, diarrhea, number three, anemia uh, or hematochesia, and then the last um, were abdominal pain and abnormal imaging. As far as the endoscopy goes, um, the TI was endoscopically normal in almost all of these patients. The TI was also histologically normal in almost all of these patients. And then the paper kind of made a point at the end um, of saying that in patients with a normal appearing TI, only 4% had ab abnormal histology. Um, diagnostic yield was found to be the highest when we visually saw gross endoscopic abnormalities. So in almost 70% of those patients where we actually saw an erosion or inflammation in the TI, there was some sort of abnormal pathology that correlated with that finding and that was statistically significant. Um, and then the second uh, highest diagnostic yield was in known or suspected Crohn's disease patients. Um, they found a correlation in about 40% of those patients with a, uh, which reached uh, significance. 
Um, and then abnormal, abnormal imaging came in uh, last um, at 32% correlation with histologic findings, but did not reach significance. Um, so the takeaways for this paper, um, do biopsy the TI in the presence of known or suspected Crohn's disease, or if the TI appears visually abnormal, um, but don't biopsy a normal appearing TI because the, uh, the yield is very low. And that's it. Did you say, did Large, you, say you want to do a capsule study on this patient? Yeah, we were going to consider doing a patency capsule and then, um, and then just doing a, in case well, we hadn't reached could, could, could you tell us what the statistics are for the patient who comes admitted with a small bowel obstruction secondary to Crohn's disease and the incidence of obstruction from a capsule during the capsule study? No, I don't know the data behind that. I, we would have done a, he hasn't actually gotten the study done yet, but we would have done a patency capsule first. And then if he wasn't able to pass that, would have done probably an MRE. Okay. Yeah, I can help you, Lauren. The, um, so the, um, the rate of capsule retention in people where the indication for the capsule study is inflammatory bowel disease um, in the literature is between three and 4%. Um, when the indication is GI bleeding, it's zero. So that's why we do the patency capsules. Um, my suspicion is this one probably wouldn't be, you know, um, stuck, but it's it's the right thing to do. So. Lauren, Lauren, just oh, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Go. Oh, I was just going to ask. You mentioned that four percent of the biopsies um, showed something histologically abnormal in normal-looking TIs. Were those histologic findings clinically significant? Or um, like, what did they show? Was it, would it have changed the diagnosis and lead to different clinical management? That's a really good point. They actually, they didn't, they didn't kind of list out everything that they saw in all of those biopsies, but they did say in general, the, the clinical significance was not strong. Um, they were, they mentioned that there were histologic findings like just distortion of the mucosa. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting if they could they could kind of delineate more exactly what they saw in the in that four percent. But I, from at least their conclusions, it didn't sound like it was very clinically important. Thanks, Lauren. Just to remind us, what what other uh, what's what else is on the differential diagnosis for uh, ileal disease or ileal thickening or um, on CT imaging? Um, terminal ileitis, super broad, like I said. So there's a lot of infectious causes. There's, of course, infl inflammatory causes like Crohn's and UC. There's, um, I guess, for infectious, you could think of things like TB. Um, there's malignancy, so a small bowel lymphomas and adenocarcinomas and things like that. So there's yeah, it's, the, the classic <laughs> ones are like Yersinia infections, TB. You think about lymphoma um, in addition to Crohn's disease, obviously malignancy. Um, like adenocarcinoma, which is pretty rare. I don't think, and outside of the setting of Crohn's, I don't think I've ever seen ileal cancer, but um, with the TI, so, okay. Any other major questions? We have a lot to get through this morning, so I think we're gonna try and move on unless someone has a burning question. All right, I am gonna turn it over. Thank you, Lauren. I'm gonna turn it over to Sephora. Hey guys, um, so I'm gonna present the second case of endoscopy conference. Uh, here we go. Um, and the case is about a 73 year old patient. She has a history of ulcerative colitis um, long time ago, underwent a subtotal colectomy with a cock pouch creation in the 1970s. Um, she actually presented with the inability to catheterize her K pouch for two days. Um, she usually does it two to three times a day. She otherwise denies any abdominal pain, no nausea, vomiting, no fever, chills, no GI bleeding. When she comes to the ED, she's hemodynamically stable. She's afebrile. Her labs, labs are completely normal. Her physical exam is pretty benign, slightly distended, um, a little bit of erythema and induration around the K-pouch valve, but otherwise normal appearance. They obtain a CT. And the CT shows multiple dilated loops of small bowel extending just proximal to the ileostomy in the midline abdomen where there's adjacent surgical suture material. There's collapse of the distal small bowel that extends to the ileostomy and there's a possible small bowel to small bowel intussusception at the surgical bed. Um, the surgical team saw the patient. Um, they were not able to decompress at bedside with the patient's own Medina tube, um, which we'll get into, and the patient was taken for ileoscopy. So time traveling back, um, so the cock pouch, uh, Dr. Rudd uh, really uh, summarizes nicely, so I'll kind of uh, just read his little paragraph, 
paragraph. So in this new operation, a pouch or reservoir is fashioned out of the terminal ileum with a valve mechanism at its exit to the skin surface. This allows storage of the liquid bowel movement, I'm sorry, bowel contact and content in an expandable container with no leakage of stool or gas and therefore no skin problems. There's no need for appliances or bags, no embarrassment from the involuntary noise and smell of flatus through the ileostomy. The stoma is created flush and within the bikini line. The patient catheterizes the pouch on an average of three times a day. Not only does this procedure solve many of the complications of a conventional ileostomy, but it helps decrease the amount of emotional trauma suffered by the young ileostomist, greatly improving the quality of life. Sounds really great. Now back uh, to the 21st century, uh, our own, very own Dr. Kayal, the cock pouch in the 21st century. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. Uh, cock pouch, also known as KP or continent ileal reservoir or continent ileostomy. It was developed by the Swedish surgeon, Niels Koch in 1969. Um, it's an alternative at that time to an end ileostomy after a proctor colectomy. Um, they have to evacuate with a catheter, which is called a Medina, usually about three times a day, and it fell out of favor in the 1980s. So if you look at how it's created, um, this is all courtesy of Dr. Maya Kayel, um, these next few slides. So the reservoir is created from a 30 centimeter loop of ileum. It's folded and sutured together, as you can see uh, down here. The nipple valve is created from about 10 centimeters of ileum that is intersuscepted, hence the CT finding of intersusception. And then the upper part of the stitched and the cut ileum is pulled down and sutures to form a pouch. And this is what you're gonna get the last picture on the right. On the nipple valve is pulled through the stoma and sutured flush with, uh, with the abdomen. Here you see a little bit of a better uh, picture. You see the skin level, level stoma, the abdominal wall, the reservoir. You see the Medina going in. That's how they uh, decompress in the actual cock pouch. Um, on the right, you see a picture in real life. This is how it's used. So the complications associated with it, um, there's a reoperation rate as high as 35% within the first two years, while our lady had it for 40 years already. Um, and nipple valve dysfunction is the most common complication and it results in incontinence or difficulty intubation. And the inability to intubate a cock pouch constitutes a medical emergency and presents as a small bowel obstruction, just like in our patients. It requires immersion pochoscopy, decompression, and catheter placement. So a little bit more about the anatomy when you go in endoscopically. So this is your scope that's going in in the first picture. And when you look, kind of look back at yourself, you will see uh, this, and it's commonly described uh, in uh, Dr. Kayal's paper as well as a volcano. Um, when it's slipped, um, it looks more like a well. Um, here you see uh, the different ways it could be slipped. So back to our case. Um, these are all OR videos, so not the nicest and prettiest, but it does its job. Let's see. So at first, so at first we went in. Um, there's actually nowhere here to go, and this is a false track that the patient probably had created over time herself. So this is not her actual cock pouch. Here we got into the reservoir. Um, you see here the valve. Um, you see our scope going in. You do see that it doesn't quite look like a volcano anymore. It kind of, you know, this, the left side is decompressed. It kind of falls down and the top is up. And here's a better picture of it. It's a good valve. <laughs> so what we did is we put a, a wire through in. Um, so we're gonna put the wire all the way through it. Um, at the end, we're gonna pull out the scope and then we're gonna push the Medina catheter over the wire. And that way um, we get the catheter in place um, and we can decompress the small bowel obstruction that this patient has. So we lose visualization because we take out the scope. <laughs> and here, and here is uh, our successful decompression of the cockpit. Um, so unfortunately, and, and we'll see this is often how it ends, but unfortunately our patient had ongoing obstruction uh, despite the decompression um, and after discussion they opted for a pouch excision. 
and in creation weren't you, of weren't you surprised options. that there was no small bowel content in the pouch? Right. Say, that, say that again? When you did the ileoscopy, there was no content in the pouch. So you knew that you weren't going to relieve the obstruction. We had, uh, we had taken out a lot of the, the stool that was there already. It was full. Yeah, we, had, uh, we have aspirated a ton of, of stool. And the CAT scan, I mean, we did this on a weekend. The CAT scan was impressive because her entire small bowel was massively dilated up to the nipple. Um, so this is the patient before, she still has a catheter in place. And here you see uh, her after the ileostomy uh, creation. She did well uh, post-op. She is actually back now in-house, just she couldn't care for her own wounds and she's uh, going to subacute rehab. So, yeah, if I can make a comment, actually, I was pretty impressed with how, you know, I was anticipated a very difficult uh, pouch excision, but you know, her, her adhesions, we're not that bad at all. So we did the case open, obviously, but I was impressed with the fact that, you know, the pouch was obviously, you know, well secured in place, you know, like locally in the pelvis and the lower abdomen, but there was really minimal amount of, of adhesions throughout. So it was actually pretty straightforward. Um, this was my first K-pouch excision, definitely memorable. I mean, it's a, um, pretty upsetting to have to take, a, to take such a beautifully constructed pouch, but, uh, uh, you know, hopefully she'll be fine. Dr. Rubin or Dr. Kayal, do you have anything to add? Was there any consideration of doing something other than removing this, as you put it, beautiful pouch? Uh, by, uh, any consideration of reconstructing the nipple valve? Uh, at least in my experience, getting that Medina in usually doesn't ultimately solve the problem. I agree, but consideration sometime can be given, perhaps in a younger a uh, person uh, to uh, consider making a new valve, which is yeah. certainly a procedure that yeah. has been done at Mount Sinai hundreds of times. Yeah, so there were many, many discussions. Trust me, this is not the kind of decision not having done a pouch reconstruction or excision or construction 12 years ago with Dr. Gorfan and Dr. Bauer. But uh, unfortunately, uh, among all the current surgeons at Mount Sinai, currently on staff, no one really felt comfortable um, with taking that risk. Um, the part of the problem is it is truly a lost art. Um, you know, very few surgeons still on staff would feel comfortable reconstructing the, the nipple. Second, as you mentioned, this is not a young patient. And so, you know, she has significant morbidities and we talked about it. I mean, you know, I, I, I thought the last resort option, if there was a younger patient who, um, you know, really wanted to have that reconstruction, we would have had you know, maybe, um, you know, discussions with surgeons are actively performing them, i.e. actively within the past year with that kind of surgical expertise. And that, that expertise is unfortunately uh, lost within Mount Sinai Hospital. I would also add, this is Jim Marion. Um, hello, this is Jim Marion. I, I would maybe, Peter, bring that number of reconstructed cock pouches down to the dozens even when they were being done and the outcomes there were not terrific. Uh, on the flip side, cock pouches in my own experience <clears throat> since the nineties. So again, this was after they were actively being done so frequently was that they seemed to be relatively low maintenance. The patients had a very high satisfaction rate with them and very little went wrong. They didn't get much, they didn't seem to get as much pouchitis but when something went wrong with a cock pouch, it really went wrong with a cock pouch. It would, uh, as this one did, it would consume a weekend. It was, uh, timing was important. You had to get in there. But the reconstruction of nipple valves, <clears throat> I always found very fraught. Complication rate was high. Short bowel syndrome, for those in whom that had failed, was a real possibility. So. This, uh, this sounds like uh, probably the ideal outcome in this era. Yeah, but Jim, the, the reconstruction, it depends on whether the reconstruction is a whole new pouch or a new valve in terms of losing bowel. I mean, you'll lose a lot of bowel if you have to do a whole new pouch, but making a new valve, as you know, what they would do is to use what had been the inflow track becomes the new outflow track valve. And when it could be done, uh, a, a lot of patients had to have it done. 
and and uh, some did well and some didn't. Admittedly, with each successive repair, there was less success. Correct. Uh, exactly. Actually, uh, my experience is that these valves are now 30 or 40 years old and they're beginning to fail. And it's a big problem. But yeah. uh, once you operate on a valve to reconstruct the nipple, there's all sorts of problems and we see repeat operations all the time. So I think this is probably a good idea to convert this to a standard ileostomy and be done with it. Just one question. I don't know, my, um, support. Can you go back to the still picture uh, of the of the pouch on retroflexion? So, I will say I was on call with Sapora when this case came up, and it was an incredibly um, wonderful learning experience. I had never seen these before. I could not explain what it was. Um, the paper that Maya, Peter, and Jerry wrote recently and published in GIE is phenomenal. And it was like a crash course in, in these in these cock pouches. So we felt we had a lot of good foundation and Maya and Peter were available for consultation before and during the procedures. And it was an incredibly gratifying procedure once we relieved the obstruction. I feel sorry for Dr. Silla that she sort of was in the way of the wave <laughs> after the, uh, the Medina catheter was replaced, but then we put it to suction and... Uh, it was incredibly gratifying. So I'd love to just acknowledge and thank Maya, Peter, and Jerry for their work and contributions in this area. My question is, um, I think because while we were there, we, we were just basing our, our, our impressions on, these, on the review article. Do you all consider this to be an abnormal valve or a partially slipped valve? Our, our take was that that left side was a little down um, and we could not get a standard upper scope through the nipple. We had to use a pediatric scope, an XP scope, and it was very difficult. It was very difficult. Well, it's, it's asymmetrical, uh, and that was commented on earlier, is, is that when you inspect these things with a U-turn, uh, you, you look to see how circumferential the, the valve is, and this is asymmetrical. Also, you're making it look good because you managed to intubate it. And so you're, it looks great. It looks as good as it's going to look because of your intubation. But the reality of it is that it's partially de and okay. that's why it's out there. So that is, not, that, that is not normal. That is yeah. angulated. Yeah, it's, well, it's I, symmetrical. I, I would say that it's not just the angulation. I agree with Peter on this, but I think that dimpling, that sort of slight cratering as the scope is going in, uh, that that would raise some alarm bells for me. Oh, um, it's a normal looking valve. <laughs> no, I disagree, Jerry, but no anyway. No matter what you say, it looks awful. <laughs> look at, if you look at the base of it, you see the base it look, comes up like a volcano. It, there's no crease, there's no uh, well effect, and it looks like a really good uh, good nipple valve. It does not a little look like A little edematous and cratered in my opinion, but that's they, just my opinion. The other thing that you look for in doing these cases is that sometimes the patient has uh, inadvertently created a fistula by trying to negotiate the hook in, in forcing the catheter in, they sometimes create a fistula. Now they've converted their valve into something that's not only hard to intubate, but also leaking because there's a fistula and you can see that on a, on a U-turn uh, as well. In this case, it doesn't look like there is a fistula, but you showed that picture where there was that cleft on the way in, and that was probably where the Medina was buckling, uh, uh, unable to uh, complete the uh, entrance into the pouch. Yeah. All right. Chris, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been able to get into one or two of these, but they're, as, as you said, um, sort of, Jim, you said they fell out of favor, you know, in the 1980s, or maybe support you said that. So, um, was it because what you said, Jim, that you know when they go wrong, they go really wrong? Or can somebody explain to me why they went out of favor? Because it does seem like a good solution to the problem. The ilioanal pull through displaced it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ilioanal, the ilioanal is much more attractive. You don't have to have a catheter. We would occasionally get calls from people saying, "I'm I'm at Club Med and I forgot my catheter." You know that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I, th I think you're the only one who ever gets those calls. <laughs> yeah, well, well, nobody goes to Club Med anymore. So, 
Yeah, it was an education for me because, again, I think it was such a drastic outcome. This patient had been doing well for 40 years, right. and then this happened, and the conversation, and, you know, Pat, Pat was educating me as well, and the, the conversation just quickly turned to, it's over. Like, the, 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 the dream of this pouch is over. It's just not working anymore, and we need to, you know, not only just revise it, but this may be a very complicated surgery given, given the, uh, you know, the, the, the intervention that was done initially and revising this is, you know, associated with high uh, uh, morbidity and, and complications. So, um, so yeah, it was an interesting discussion with the family because it was just like, yep, that's it. There's, there's not much else we can do. And Dave, just to address your question about why did they fall out of favor, I think what we're looking at here is an entire generational change. The reason, and as Spora pointed out with that newspaper article interviewing a surgeon, you don't see that happening very much anymore. The reason there was a newspaper article featuring Dr. Koch about this is that it was a genuine in, uh, innovation. It was a huge sea change for these patients who would otherwise require a brucheliostomy, which was all anybody was doing. So that was really the last word, but that naturally led to the ileoanal pouch, which as uh, Peter pointed out, is far more attractive for uh, patients. Great, thanks. All right, outstanding. Thank you Thank so you. much. We are gonna move on to Nick. And hopefully after Nick, we, uh, Dr. Katz has a video that we hopefully can get to as well. So I'll turn it over to Nick. All right, thank you. So today I'm going to present a case called Plugging the Leak. Uh, the patient's an 81-year-old female, history of lupus anticoagulant and atrial fibrillation on rivaroxaban, breast cancer in the past, and most importantly, severe mitral regurgitation. She actually presented with worsening dyspnea on exertion and was admitted for a planned mitral valve repair. On pre-op labs, she was noted to be anemic and she had uh, fecal occult blood testing on the outside that was positive. And so GI was consulted for anemia workup prior to surgery. So she underwent an unremarkable upper endoscopy and then the colonoscopy was performed. What you're gonna see is a little bit here pulling back in the sigmoid colon. And unfortunately, an iatrogenic perforation occurred during the colonoscopy. Mm. You can see a uh, full thickness perforation. You can see fat through the hole. So at this point, the decision was made. It was recognized very early. Uh, as you can see, it's a very good prep. So there was no contamination. There was no stool flowing through the hole. And the advanced endoscopy team was called into the room at this point to, for management of the perforation. And the decision was made to attempt to close the perforation endoscopically. So what you're seeing in this still image is a clear cap with these metal teeth, which are the teeth of an over the scope clip. And I'll show how this, how this works. Uh, the patient was also given a dose of antibiotics at this point. So there's a twin grasping forceps that comes uh, with this kit. And you can see there's a, two sides to it that are individually controlled. So this first arm is used to grab the tissue on the top. And there's a second arm that can be opened again separately and used to approximate these edges of the cool. defect together. And then at this point, uh, everything comes together nicely. You can see it's going to be a good closure. The edges are well approximated. And then using the grasper to pull in, in combination with suction, the entire defect is pulled into the cap. And then the over the scope clip is deployed off of the cap. It's now deployed, it's you slipped onto there the grasping forcep is removed and you can start to see the clip in place here. And then the defect is examined and essentially the defect is entirely contained within the clip. On the left side, you can see some normal mucosa, then the defect through the middle of the clip and the right side is examined. Uh, the defect ends before the clip. So basically the entire preparation is contained within the clip. 
there, we also explored the other potential major concern with a clip this large is occluding the lumen. Uh, you don't see it in this video, but to the right, the lumen is patent and we explored that as well, just to confirm. Uh, the patient did amazingly well. In PACU, she woke up with no pain and she was asking to go home. Uh, we didn't feel that was appropriate because of the potential for, for complication and still the potential for need for surgery if that closure had failed. Uh, so she was again given antibiotics, kept NPO. She had no, uh, basically an uncomplicated course, no fever, tachycardia, hypotension. She had imaging with contrast, which showed the clip in place. There's a little fat stranding you can see on the left here, a little inflammation around the area of the closure, but no free air and no extravasation of contrast. And she was discharged three days after the procedure. So just to go over this device, uh, it has many uses. In this case, we used it for a perforation closure but it comes in different sizes for different scope sizes. We used a therapeutic gastroscope in this case, which is probably the most common. Uh, the clip is a, a 12 millimeter diameter cap uh, that goes onto the scope. And then there are two or three main tools you can use to bring the tissue into the cap. You can use that twin grasper forceps that was demonstrated uh, in this video. There's also sort of a trident that you use for perforations that hooks the tissue and pulls it in. And there's a single grasping forceps you can also use. And the clip is deployed similar to a banding device with uh, just a rotating handle that pushes it off of the cap. So we use it frequently in uh, leaks or fistulas. You can use it in perforation from diagnostic endoscopy as was done here, or from therapeutic endoscopy such as polypectomy EMR. Uh, it also can be used in, as a rescue therapy in bleeding. Success, especially in perforations, leaks, and fistulas depends on time. In an acute perforation, its closures are very successful. As you could see in the video, the tissue is very pliable and easy to approximate and the success rate is 80 to 100%. In more delayed perforation, after a few days or a few weeks, the tissue becomes more fibrotic. It can be very difficult to approximate and the success rate drops to about 50 to 60%. There are a few predictors in this setting of perforation closure that might predict a need for surgery, which are the size, um, clinical factors such as leukocytosis, fever, abdominal pain, or a large amount of pneumoperitoneum on imaging. Our patient had uh, none of these factors aside from a fairly large perforation. In this study, they defined that as greater than a centimeter. But uh, now that we have clips that are able to close a perforation that are greater than a centimeter, that's not too much of an issue as long as it still fits within the clip. That is that. What was the cause of the perforation? That's, the, uh, that's an important part of doing colonoscopy. Why should they perforate? What happened? The patient had diverticulosis and that location was at a very tight turn. Uh, I, I suspect that might've been a diverticulum that actually perforated during scope manipulation. Boy, that's rare. Yeah, it was an unfortunate. We perforate diverticula. We perforate from making a big loop, stretching it, and then uh, the loop the loop actually stretches the colon wall and it perforates. Yeah, I think this was on early insertion because uh, we hadn't gotten much further in the colon at that point. That was a great video and explanation. I think the couple of sort of key learning points for perforations when, when they happen. Um, it can't be understated enough that early recognition is absolutely paramount. So you wanna identify perforation during the index procedure. Um, and that, that gives the patient the highest risk, uh, sorry, highest chance of success for closure. 
A um, couple other things that you had mentioned that um, just to reiterate that are important is that you want to minimize the luminal contents from leaving. So if you have to rotate the patient, um, putting them on their back or right lateral even uh, to prevent any GI contents from getting extra luminal, um, that's also important because if there's anything that leaves the lumen may require a washout by surgery. And then um, obviously the, the third important point is um, successful closure. Um, the, the other thing is that you should be using carbon dioxide for all cases. And um, that paper that you showed where one of the early surgery factors was a large amount of pneumoperitoneum. When you're using CO2 and you have capnoperitoneum, you can decompress the belly using a virus needle or an angiocath. And um, that uh, amount of capnoperitoneum now doesn't factor in so much um, for taking the patient to the OR. It's really, um, it's really going to be, was it identified early? Did you prevent GI contents from getting extra luminally and was it successfully closed? And usually these patients do require some kind of confirmatory fluoroscopic exam, either in the fluoroscopy rooms using a contrast injection or a CT with either oral or rectal contrast, because you want to make sure that there's no extravasation of contrast. And if you do have an extravasation, then you either need to re-intervene endoscopically or in most cases, they need to go to the OR. Um, and that's why delayed perforations oftentimes have to go to the OR because um, you've got stool and whatnot that's going into the abdominal cavity and those patients often have peritonitis and need a washout. So sort of those three important points just to reemphasize are early identification that's the most important, preventing GI luminal contents from leaving, um, and then successful closure. And um, our team is always available to help out whenever there's any um, any issues. So, you know, don't hesitate to call any of us. Just to, just to uh, add to Nikhil's thoughtful comments, um, I want to commend the consult team for maintaining their composure. Um, you know, we were down the hall between cases. We had a knock on the door. Hey, can you guys come in? You know, I think everyone recognized what was going on, but you know, in, the, in, in 10 or 15 years ago, if this happened, the practice was to remove the scope as fast as possible, call surgery and have the patient go to the OR. But I think as we start to, um, you know, as we expose everybody more and more to the interventions we can do, it was great that, um, you know, our team was, was called in immediately um, and we were able to do this. And Nick, this took, I don't know, three minutes to close. Yeah. It was, it, it couldn't have gone any better. And, and uh, I think the next week there was another similar case where you participated as well, right? Correct, so same the exact same thing happened again in another diagnostic colonoscopy and we made the exact same closure. A patient was discharged within 48 hours uh, after a clean scan. Outstanding. Does anyone know why she was hemocult positive? Ah, the mystery continues. So she will actually need another colonoscopy. Oh. But we were going to wait a couple weeks after the closure, after the perforation. Yeah, so she's actually being set up with me for a, okay. a colonoscopy in a few weeks. Finish the job. We have time for uh, that. Was outstanding. Thank Great you. Great job, so much, everyone. Nick. Really. We have time for one more. Uh, Dr. Katz has a video. Um, Brian, do you want me to to share my screen and show it? Are you on? You're muted, you're muted. This is a 75 year old woman uh, who presented with a week of intractable nausea. Uh, she had the standard workup, CAT scan was negative. She'd had an endoscopy recently, it was normal. Uh, the CAT scan was remarkable for gallstones. Uh, the nausea was severe and she kept on vomiting non-bilious content. Uh, we couldn't find an explanation for this. So we knew she had gallstones. I thought we should take out the gallbladder. And then at laparoscopy, this is what I found. Showed the laparoscopy. Everyone can see this video? Okay. Yeah. Okay, if you stop there, if you stop there, if you look, the stomach is right in front of us. That's the antrum. And you see the gallbladder to the left of the field. And now play the video, Chris, please. If you see the stomach is contracting like crazy, 
it's the antrum contracting and the gallbladder is pulled over the duodenum. And basically the adhesion between the gallbladder over the duodenum, I think was causing her nausea and a gastric obstruction. Um, and basically I, I did a lap coli, I cut the adhesion, did a lap coli. She woke up, the nausea was gone. She's about 10 days out now and eating everything. I just never, I've never seen this as a cause of gastric obstruction. She had an endoscopy? She had an endoscopy that was normal, nothing was seen. Hmm. I think that the, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an extrinsic cause of obstruction from the gallbladder, gallbladder being pulled over the duodenum. So Chris, we had another, I've never seen this before. And then two weeks before, I'll, I'll present it next week. We had a patient admitted with uh, nausea and vomiting and a crazy CT scan that looked like a gastric volvulus. And when we operated on the patient, she had an adhesion running from subhepatic across the uh, distal stomach, actually proximal to the antrum, causing complete GI obstruction, a uh, gastric obstru outlet obstruction. So I'll show the next week. It's fascinating pictures at CAT scan. And she's completely better. These, these patients are completely better. Completely better, both of them. And, and to be honest, I've never seen gastric obstruction once in 45 years from adhesive disease. And we had two in a matter of two weeks. <laughs> All right.